I'm curious. Mark 16, 15 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So why are we? What's stopping us? Is it fear of rejection or embarrassment? Shame in who we are and what we believe? Or maybe our comfort? It is the pastor's job anyway. I know it's not a popular word right now, but I think it's about time we talk about it. Well, hey, y'all, how you doing? Wow, that's loud, isn't it? So, everybody all right? Y'all doing okay? Do you, hey, can I, can I, I, let me give you a prayer request. Could you pray that it would actually, like, somebody would let the weather know that it's spring? Because it is cold out there. I've been walking back. I, I'm rebelling against it because I refuse to wear a jacket. Therefore, I'm trying to make it spring by not wearing a jacket. I can tell you right now that does not work. This, this, this experiment is a failure, but at any rate, it's kind of cold out there, but thank God it's going to warm up the rest of this week. Hey, we're going to be wrapping up our series today out of The E Word, uh, a book that uh, Pastor Curtis and I put together. And if you haven't picked this up yet, I want you to pick it up. Not because we need to sell books. We don't need to sell books. But because what, we, what this does is it gives us a language with which we can speak into the culture around us. Uh, let, let me say it this way. Everybody, everybody hear me. Everybody hear me. Our culture, can I, can I just get an amen? Let me see if you agree. Our culture is kind of jacked up right now. Everybody's okay. You understand what I'm saying when I say that? Let me explain to you why I think this is happening. We are, as a culture, all using the same vocabulary. We are using different dictionaries. Everybody's got it? We're all using the same vocabulary, but we're all using different dictionaries. What this does is it tries to help you speak into modern culture using some of the dictionary that is out there today versus the dictionary we, especially those of us who've been in the church a long time, have been accustomed to. So what, that's what we're trying to do here is trying to talk to you about evangelism from a modern uh, standpoint. So grab that if you can, okay? Now, uh, here's what I want you to understand about evangelism. Remember where we started. We must take responsibility for evangelism, okay? Evangelism is your job and my job. Somebody say amen. All right, do me a favor. Look at your neighbor, whoever's beside you, and say he's talking to you. Just go ahead and tell him. Say he's talking to you. And the reason I'm talking to you is I want you to understand that evangelism is everybody's job. All of us have to do this. All of us have to reach the lost with the good news of Jesus Christ. You've got it? Nobody gets out of it. We all have this calling. The second week we talked about taking responsibility for culture because what we want to do sometimes is just say, forget culture. Culture doesn't matter. Culture doesn't agree with me, so we walk away from it. And we run into our churches. We run into our Christian groups, our Christian homes, our Christian schools, our Christian whatever it might be, our Christian stores, our, all of those things, and we just avoid the world. We really can't do that either because God's called us to reach the world that is jacked up. Everybody's got that? Sin messed us up. We've got to now bring the redemptive power of Jesus to the face of sin so that Jesus can fix what sin messed up. That's why evangelism matters. We must take responsibility for evangelism and we must take responsibility for our culture. Finally, and this is today, today's sermon is we must take responsibility for the people, the relationships around us. I want everybody to hear me. Evangelism best spoken is relationship soaked in grace. Without relationship, you really cannot evangelize other people. You can talk to them about Jesus, but it's kind of like trying to talk to them about anything. Why would they believe you if they don't know you? Evangelism really is relationship soaked in grace. And so when we take responsibility for the relationships around us, then we begin to get ourselves into a place where we can reach people with the good news of Christ. Now, <clears throat> I need you to understand that taking responsibility for relationships is not always easy and often comes at a high price. I'll give you the example from Scripture, which we have today. 
Jesus took, took responsibility for his relationship with us that was, that was broken by sin, and he paid the price for our sins in order to reestablish the relationship with us. You understand that's what he did, right? His death on the cross was really a matter of reestablishing a relationship that had been broken at the Garden of Eden. And so Jesus now needed to reestablish that. And I want, to, I want to show it to you in this format. If you go to Hebrews in your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles or your devices, Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to be in verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 12. In order to lay the groundwork for this, let me explain to you that Hebrews chapter 11 is really the hall of fame for faith in the New Testament. So in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews talks about all these people who had all this faith and did all these great things. That's what he's just gotten through talking about. And then we get to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and it says this, There Therefore, in the light of all these people of great faith, therefore, in light of all these people who did these great things, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these people we've just talked about, and the people now in our lives today that we know who, who would fall in this, in this category of great cloud of witnesses, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You understand there's a whole sermon right in there that I can't preach today because it's not our sermon. I just need you to hear it, okay? Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter, the center of our faith. Watch this. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Let me give you a word picture. Well, let me tell you a story. Jesus tops a hill at one point in his ministry just before, the week before he dies on the cross. He tops the hill, and the Bible gives us this imagery as when he tops the hill, he sees Jerusalem, and he weeps over the city, okay? Jesus knows what is in front of him. He knows that if he continues into Jerusalem, he's walking into the heart of a storm that will end with him on a cross. He knows this. He knows what's in front of him. And he chooses in that moment not to run away from the storm, which he could have. He chose instead to walk into the storm. For the joy set before him. Why would he do that? For the joy set before him. When he looked forward and saw you come to faith in Christ, he went to the city. For the joy set before him. When he looked forward and saw every human being, including you and me, come to Christ from that point forward, for the image that was that, he walked forward into the storm. Watch. And he died, endured the cross, scorning its shame. Let me give you a new imagery on this. Scorning its shame. When the Bible says he scorned the shame of the cross, I need, let, 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 let me get you to see this right. Many of you are wearing crosses, maybe on a necklace, or maybe you have a pin, or maybe you have a cross somewhere on you, <clears throat> or at home you have crosses hanging on the wall. Let me get you into a first, first century mindset. Adorning your walls, decorating your house, or decorating yourself with a cross in the first century would be the same as you decorating your house today with an electric chair. It is a tool of execution. That's what it was. But Jesus, watch, just watch how, watch how beautiful this is. Jesus scorned the shame of that tool of execution and won victory over it to the point that now it is an image to adorn yourself with and it makes you feel as if you are protected rather than threatened. That's what Jesus did with this. He so changed our view of it. He scorned his shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I, I need you to understand. Our relationships will require that we pay a price. What price are you willing to pay to see those relationships grow the way they should and bring others into a relationship with God? 
What is the price you'd be willing to pay? In fact, can I ask you another question? What's the price you would be willing to pay in order to endure whatever storm comes your way so that others can know the God that you know? We're going to tell you stories today. But all those stories are going, to, are going to work to one end. And I'm going to tell you the end at the beginning. All those stories are going to work to the end of saying to you, you can share your faith. You can pay this price. You can take this risk. This past summer, Tina and I took a little trip. Uh, we went down to a place in North Carolina that my grandpa Freeman, my grandma and grandpa Freeman are from. Um, all of you have heard me talk about my grandfathers. Both of my grandfathers were Wesleyan pastors. Both of them were wonderful men of God. Uh, I really did not grow up with a, a, very, a very solid father figure in my life. My stepdad was a good man, uh, but I wouldn't say he was, I, he, I wouldn't call him someone I wanted to emulate when I became a father. So the father figures in my life really were my grandparents, my grandfathers, and I learned from them how to be men of God. I learned from them how to be fathers. I learned from them all those things. I've always really looked up to them, but it was only a few years ago that I, I understood in a deeper way the story of my grandma and grandpa Freeman. You see, we had heard uh, of the place they were, they were from, and I've been there my whole life. I've been there, there for homecomings. I've been there for different reasons all throughout my, my life. They are from a little area in North Carolina that is not a city. It's not organized. It's just, it's just an area. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place out in the country. It's a wide spot in the road, and they call it Love Joy. What a great name for a place. You know, it's Love Joy is the name of it. There are some places that are just named, and it makes you, makes you want to go visit them, you know. Now, my grandpa Hilson pastored in a place called Hellhole Swamp. <laughs> come, jo <laughs> come join us for church, and no, I don't think that's going to work. But Grandpa Freeman was from, was from Lovejoy, and so, you know, it, it's just outside of Troy, North Carolina, and it's in, it's in Montgomery County, North Carolina. And so Tina and I went down there because we had heard a story that I wanted to go down and find somebody that could verify the story, and we did. We found some folks that verified the story. Seems that my grandma's people, the Hewlands, uh, lived down there, and, and, the, and the church, Lovejoy United Methodist Church, I'd always wondered why it was that Grandpa found his way to Central Wesleyan College in Central South Carolina from Lovejoy, North Carolina, when he went to a Methodist church. I figured it out. Lovejoy was not planted as a Methodist church. Lovejoy was started as a Wesleyan Methodist church, which made it the same as the Wesleyan Methodist College, which is in Central South Carolina because it used to be known as Central Wesleyan Methodist College. And so, so it started, the church started as a Wesleyan Methodist church. You say, well, why does that matter? It's just another word in front of Methodist, but it's an important word. Because in the early 1800s, when this church was planted, it was planted because a group of people got together and said, we need a new church. And when you ask them the question, why do you need a new church? The answer was because the Methodist church won't take a stand against slavery and we are abolitionists. We're not going to go to church there anymore. And so they sent up into Ohio for a pastor to come down so that they could have an abolitionist pastor plant an abolitionist centered church in the heart of the South. This did not make them popular. Another church up the road, uh, a few counties up, another Wesleyan Methodist church. Now, literally, we still have the old building, uh, and the old building, the doors are still there. The original doors are still there. There are bullet holes in the doors from people shooting at the church while they're holding church services. This didn't make them popular, but they planted the church anyway. The Civil War broke out. And toward the end of the Civil War, literally just months before Lee surrenders at Appomattox, the, the, a part of the Confederate Army came through Lovejoy. And they ran into the Hewlin family, and the Hewlins had three boys that were of fighting age. The youngest one was 12, but back then 12 was fighting age. And they told him, you're going to fight for the Confederate Army. And they said, no, we, we won't. They said, you have to, you're Southerners. They said, no, we can't. What do you mean you can't? And they began to explain to them the theology, the spiritual truth they had been taught their whole lives because they believed that Jesus actually died for all people. And they said, no, we won't fight. Now, that sounds like a great story, doesn't it? Let me tell you 
that I wish I could give you a good ending. But I can't. Because Tina and I went to stand in front of those three graves. Because when they refused to fight in front of their parents, the Confederate soldiers shot and killed the two oldest ones and hung the youngest 12-year-old. Then took their bodies and threw them in the front of the Lovejoy Church to say to them, if this is what your church is about, this is what you're going to get out of it. And the blood of those boys stained that floor, a stain that is there to this day at the front of that church. Sometimes our faith puts us in a storm that puts us at risk. But can I ask you a question? What is the salvation of every human around you actually worth to you? I, I got to be honest. We're not asking, y'all, y'all, in, in our setting, in our culture, nobody's asking you to take a bullet for Jesus. Around the world, that happens. Today, even today, that hap that's happening around the world, but not here. Nobody's asking you to crawl up on a cross because Jesus already did that for us. All we're asking is that you would have the courage to talk to people about Jesus. But sometimes relationships have a cost. Good morning. Okay, so I have tea with me because my voice has been giving out today. I don't know if it's allergies or what. But last service, I, I thought I was going to have a coffin fit. So I kind of had to stop talking a little bit. And I texted my wife, and I told her what happened. And she responded, said, well, maybe God was trying to tell you to shut up. I was like, thank you, my helper. <laughs> so um, you know, forgive me if that happens. I will, I'll sip on tea, and we'll make it through it. Um, so look, in this conversation about uh, evangelism, Pastor Mike was talking about storms and how we go through different storms. I'm going to tell you two stories. Here's the first one. The first one's history. The second one is a, a, a personal story that's happened in my life. The, the first story is a man named John Wesley. And John Wesley was somebody who had spent his life doing everything he could to try to be the best he could for the God he served. So this man, he, they, they actually gave him uh, the nickname when he was in college. They said he's, him and his little group of people, those are Methodists because they were so methodical about how they did everything. He was so methodical about how he did everything. He had to read at a certain time. He prayed a certain number of times a day. He did everything right, but he wasn't seeing the fruit that he wanted to see in his life, the fruit that he believed was promised. And I don't know if you've ever felt like that. It's like I'm doing everything that I can, but I'm not seeing what it is that I want to see. So he had gone through his life, and he was in his, I believe it was his early 30s, and he went on this, this trip to America to plant a church or to take over a church, and it didn't work out. So he's disappointed and heading home, once again disappointed in a, a ministry that didn't work out. He wants to see people's lives change. He's, he's doing everything right. And as they're going across the ocean, the, 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 the boat starts to rock. The storm shows up. And as this storm shows up, everybody is now kind of settled with the fact that this boat's probably going to capsize and we're probably not making it home. So John Wesley looks around and he, as he's contemplating what it's going to mean to actually this is going to be the end of his life, he, he looks over and sees these people called the Moravians. The Moravians are believers. The Moravians are Christians. And when he looked over and he saw these Moravians, he saw a group of people that were singing hymns while he was scared for his life. And he looked at them and thought, they have something I don't have. Because I've been doing everything right, but for some reason, when it comes down to being in the middle of the storm, they have a peace. They're rooted in something that apparently I'm not rooted in. They have something that I don't have. And in my life, I had that example. You know, I didn't, I've told you before, I didn't grow up, you know, going to church. I would go some and go to my grandma's Orthodox church. I'd, I'd get drugged to church by my mom every once in a while, but I never wanted to go. So growing up, I had some friends that were believers. I had some friends that weren't, but one of my friends, some of you may know him. Some of you may have seen him. His name's Anthony Anderson. And Anthony looks a lot different than me. Anthony's six foot nine black dude. I'm five, four and white. 
We look funny together, but we just, it kind of worked out. We were just always best friends. We always hung out. Well, Anthony would tell me about Jesus. Anthony would tell me about Jesus, but, but for me, I was never really interested. But then this moment came in Anthony's life where I, I assumed it was gonna be the separation, it was gonna be the severance of our friendship. Not that we weren't gonna like each other anymore, but that he was going on to bigger and better things and I was, I was, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna just stay home because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Anthony got a scholarship and Anthony went to play for Morgan State, D1 basketball at Morgan State. And I stayed home to play Call of Duty and eat Cheez-Its because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. But Anthony would always pick up the phone and call me. And I didn't understand why. Because it's like, dude, I'm like, I'm on the couch. <laughs> you, have, you have classes to go to. You have practice to go to. You have these bigger and better things. But he would always reach out and he would always check in. So we maintained this relationship through college. I got a call one night. It was late at night and I was at a friend's house and they said, hey, did you hear about Anthony? I said, no, what happened? They said, Anthony, Anthony got diagnosed with cancer. He has leukemia. And I called him the next day and we talked and he's like, I had been losing my appetite. I got these lumps in the back of my neck and I came in and they told me I have, I have leukemia. I gotta start chemo and they're starting the process. Well, his biggest concern was that they were gonna shave his head. And my response was like, dude, you're 6'9 and black. You're gonna look fantastic. <laughs> like you're gonna look like Michael Jordan. And then I had this idea in my head. I'm like, what if I shaved my head too? So I shaved my head to make him feel better, and then I went and looked in the mirror and immediately realized that I made a mistake. Because <laughs> I looked at myself, and I was like, I look like an accident. I showed up at the hospital. He looked more handsome than he did before. I look like a toddler with an Adam's apple. And I was like, this is not, this is not okay. You know, and Anthony started his battle with cancer. Anthony started his battle with cancer, and as he started to fight, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges that I saw in his life was all the people that had promised to be there that left. I watched all these people leave his side because as he was going through the storm, they, they didn't have the time, they didn't have the energy to go through the storm with them. I watched Anthony's dreams of ever playing basketball again go away. I watched, I watched this man fight for his life over and over and over again to the point where he went into remission, got enrolled back in school only for a couple days later, the, the, the doctor to tell him after he enrolled in school that he has to come back to the hospital because the blood cell count is off again. And he went back and he battled for six, seven years and he battled and he battled and he battled, but I saw something interesting in these couple moments in Anthony's life. These couple moments in Anthony's life, I, I, saw, I saw Anthony when he was at his lowest and in the most pain, investing his time and energy in the people in the hospital rooms around him. <coughs> that thing's happening, hold on. <coughs> Last service, a lady said, you were getting so emotional. I said, no, I was coughing. <clears throat> Hold on, I think it's going to come back. <clears throat> I watched a man. It's going to sound like I have a frog in my throat and I'm going to talk through it. Just bear with me. <clears throat> I got to watch a man show the love of Jesus Christ when he was at his deepest, darkest moments. I got to watch a man who had everything stripped away from him and something that was inside of him that was rooted in eternity. I got to see something different. I got to see something that I hadn't seen in other people that said they were Christians. I got to see something, this representation, and I looked at him, I would imagine a lot like John Wesley looked at the Moravians. And I said, he has something that I don't have. <coughs> My desire to start seeking God did not come from people saying the right words. It came from somebody that was living the right life. And you know, I, 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 I think back on these times with Anthony where he was, 
he was 135 pounds at six foot nine. I was flat broke, and I'd go over to his house, and we would just spend time together. And we were just this pitiful little pair. And we used to talk about it. We're like, man, one day it's going to be all good. We're going to have money. We're going to get tall Swedish women. Like, life's going to be good. We're going to be fine. So here's the crazy thing about that. <coughs> Anthony's 6'9 in black. I'm 5'4 in white. We both married 5'9 Swedish women. Come on, somebody. <coughs> He was here this morning, and I said it, and you heard, yeah, it sounds like James Earl Jones, so. <clears throat> but look, I was, I walked through this journey, and I watched Anthony do it gracefully. I watched him do it serving people rather than just hoping people were going to serve him. But this isn't a sermon about how great Anthony is. This is a sermon about God's grace and provision in a storm if we will surrender to him. Listen to this. <clears throat> the night that I gave my life to, to Jesus, I was in Anthony's basement. Anthony fell asleep. He always fell asleep on me. I used to take him to dinner. I took him to Carabas, and he literally just passed out, and his neck was real long. It was always like a fear of him hitting his head on the table, like a giraffe. <laughs> he fell asleep. I went into the other room, <clears throat> and I read this, Matthew 7, 21. I got a whole bunch of stuff going on up here. It'll be fine. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't casted out any demons lately or a lot of these things that Jesus was talking about. These were people that were were outwardly living the life, but inwardly did not know Jesus. They did not know him. He said, depart from me. I never knew you. The difference between Anthony and a lot of other Christians that I knew was Anthony knew this Jesus he served. And because he knew this Jesus he served when he was in the storm, he knew where he was rooted. I'm rooted in eternity. I'm rooted in something that's bigger than this storm. I'm rooted in a story that's bigger than this storm. And if this storm takes me out, that was, I called him one day and I said, man, how do you do this? You know what his answer was? And I I remember this day. I was in traffic. I was coming home and I was frustrated. I was frustrated with my job. I was frustrated with all these different things. And I called him. I said, how do you do this? He said, man, I'm just thankful. He was in the hospital. I said, what do you mean you're thankful? I didn't understand. I walked into Anthony's house one night and I watched him. Tears were streaming down his face and I thought he was just broken in half. I thought he was having a rough day, but his hands were in the air. He was worshiping this God who I was about to meet. He had something. He was rooted in Jesus. He was rooted in God because the difference isn't just that they were doing the right things. The difference is when we know him, when we allow him in when we're willing to sacrifice, when we're willing to let go. Next part of this scripture says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with the great crash. You know, my biggest fear in life isn't, (laughs) my biggest fear in life isn't that I won't go try my best and do a lot of things that I think are important. My biggest fear in life is that I'll spend every amount, every ounce of energy that I can muster doing something that's just gonna go away with my life because it wasn't rooted in him. And we look at this idea of legacy, but we look past people and we look at a career. We look past the individual and we look at our own selfish ambition. Anthony in his darkest moments spent time focusing on other people. In his highest moments, he spent time focusing on other people. And in that, I got to see the love of Jesus. In that, I got to see a glimpse in that I got to see what it meant to be a follower. And I finally realized what the difference was between me and Anthony. He had built his house on the rock. I had been building mine on the beach.
So understand this. The truth we're learning today is not about the people. Anthony's awesome. Anthony's awesome. The Hewlin boys were awesome. The Moravians on the boat were awesome. But the truth is not about the people. The truth today is not about the storm. Storms were horrible in every case and threatened life, took life. The truth is about the rock. The rock on which we stand. Can I, can I, can I just say to you, I, I want you to see two major things here. Number one, I want you to understand, I, if anybody's struggling with it, I, I want you to understand, God did not send a storm to rock that boat John Wesley was on in order to impress John Wesley with the Moravians. God did not cause that storm in order to impress John Wesley. God did not send the, the Confederate troops to kill the Hewlin boys so I could tell a cool story today. That's not how that happened. God did not give Anthony cancer so that he could reach, uh, reach Curtis. That, that's not, that's, you're miss, some people say things like that, and they are wrong. Our God doesn't function that way, and if our God did function that way, how is he a good God if he functions that way? That's not what, what happened. Here's the story. Listen to me. All of us have been through storms or will go through storms. Storms are constant. They're going to come. The question is not, have you been through a storm or are you going to go through a storm? The question is, when the storm shows up, what are you standing on? You see, I thought this was about evangelism. It absolutely is. Because the Moravians had no idea that there was a, a, a preacher on the other end of the boat watching them in the middle of that storm as they sang praises to their God. I dare say the Hewlin boys had no thought in their mind that at some point a fourth, fifth, sixth generation descendant of theirs would tell their story 150 years later. The whole point is Jesus. And you have people around you that have been watching you live your life. And you need to start telling them where your strength comes from. You need to start bringing them to the Jesus that will give them strength. There are people in your life you need to bring to the rock so they have somewhere to put a foot and find some traction. You say, but I've told them a thousand times. Then by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, tell them a thousand and one times. Because eternity matters, and their eternity rests on this moment. You say, Pastor, you're, you're, you're going over the top. Am I? I don't think so. You got to understand, this, reaching the lost is what we exist for. We bring glory to our God by praising him. We bring glory to our God by serving him, but we bring the greatest glory to our God by bringing others to him. It's time we started reaching those God has put around us. The situation you're in, the circle you're in, all of that is intentional. God knows the people around you. And can I, can I, let me just give you a word. I can't reach them for you. I can preach the gospel to them if you put them in front of us. But I can't reach them for you. They're going to have to find Christ through you because they know you. They don't know me. You say, then what are you suggesting we do? I'm suggesting that all I can give you is a tool. You say, well, what's that? Everybody, you, you, let, me, let me get you to understand something. Even people that don't really believe in God, they will show up at church on Easter. They will show up at church on Christmas Eve. They will show up at church when you get baptized. And they will show up at church when you dedicate your babies. So you know what we do at all the four of those points? We try to talk about Jesus and how to be saved. So I'm here to tell you that next Sunday, 
we're gonna present the gospel in a simple way that people can receive. Now let me tell you what's been going on with you all morning. There are some of you in this room that all morning you've had people's names and faces in your mind and you for the life of you cannot figure out why. You've been worried all morning that maybe you need to pray for them because maybe something's going wrong. You've been asking God to take care of them and you've been asking God just, just what, what, Lord, whatever it is, I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna tell you what it is. God was preparing you for this moment because he's calling you to reach them and bring them to hear the gospel of Christ, the gospel of salvation. He's asking you to show them the rock that they can stand on. But the question is, what are you gonna do about that? Hey, and welcome to the New Life YouTube channel. This is a place where you'll find messages from the New Life teaching team, moments of worship, content from New Life at your house, and more to help you grow closer to God from wherever you are. You can stay inspired weekly by clicking that subscribe button so you can stay current on everything we release. And then come back on Sundays at 9 and 11 for our live online experience with messages from Pastor Mike Hilson and worship with the New Life at Your House team, all hosted by Pastor Dave and Emily. We'll see you soon.